Good morning and thank you for joining us at the BMS session at this year's Baptist Assembly. My name is Sarah, it's my colleague Ben, and we are the Directors of Communication here at BMS World Mission. Hasn't it been a cracking assembly so far? Absolutely. I don't know about you, but I have so appreciated the chance just to gather together and reflect on this crazy, crazy year. And then the challenge that Shane brought us last night, oh, it was just brilliant. I've, I'm still reflecting on that and I can't wait to hear more from him later. I was reflecting as well this morning on, on his comments about how we all share this desire to see life after death, but also this desire to see life while we're still here on earth. And to be honest, I just, I couldn't have put it any better myself. You know, that's at the absolute heart of, of what we want to see here at BMS. So with no further ado, I hope you've got a coffee. I hope you're settled in nice and comfy because we've got a cracking hour coming up for you. We are going to kick off by looking back and we're going to have a think about the heart we shared to see one million people's lives transformed over the last five years. And then we're going to flick forward and our general director Kang San will be sharing some of his hopes and plans and dreams for our next few years. As you'd expect, we're going to be hearing from plenty of people around the world. And of course, we're going to come together in a time of prayer and to celebrate what God has been doing. And then we're going to have the chance to finish with a live Q&A. So please be thinking about the questions you might want to ask us. Remember, you can drop those into the chat. Make sure you're signed in first and we'll be delighted to have a listen to what you would like to ask us. You know, seven years ago when we were beginning to discuss what God might be calling us to in the period from 2015 to 2020, there was something that was niggling at us a little bit. We knew we were blessed to be involved in some incredible work around the world. And we knew that God was doing amazing things through our partners and personnel who were serving faithfully uh, in pursuit of the gospel. But we didn't always know the, the full extent of that fruit, the detail of the many wonderful ways that God was working. And that was holding us back a little bit. Um, it made it harder for us to tell you the full extent of what your support was achieving. We sort of lessened our chances to learn from all the different aspects of the work and to maximise fruitfulness. And it was also harder to discern where to prune and where to concentrate efforts in order to build God's kingdom. So we felt we were being called by God to do a better job of tracking down every single part of the fruit of our labour so that we could have the biggest impact on transforming lives. And so it was in light of that we set ourselves this faith-stretching target of seeing one million lives transformed over that five-year period, 2015 to 2020. And it, it seemed almost impossible at the time, as so many good visions are. But we believe that by the grace of God, with the partnership of the World Church and with the faithful support of Baptists in the UK, that we could see this realised. We believed God could use us to touch the lives of one million of his precious children. And, you know, you've been on that journey with us uh, every year. We've kept feeding back at assemblies and elsewhere um, about how we're getting on towards that goal of one million lives. After one year, it was 170,000. After two years, it was 387,000. After three years, it was 648,000. After four years, it was 915,000. And so now, Kang San here, you've got an envelope and you can reveal to us how we got on by the end of that five year period. And thanks in Jesus' name for all the encouragement, support of Baptists around the world. We now have 1.3 million lives transformed! <laughs> <laughs> Celebrating Gangnam Style! <laughs> In a moment, I'm going to get Steve, my colleague, to come and share with us all the details and nitty-gritty. But before that, we are going to show you a video with some tremendous highlights. And I know that Sarah later would also want to tell you more about some of the peoples and partners.
Well, thank you for that low-key and very elegant reveal, Kansang. Uh, and we'd just like to uh, take that step back now. I remember five years ago being in assembly and talking about this faith-stretching goal of one million lives transformed. And here we are five years later, taking stock and feeding back. So you will remember that we had seven different ministry areas. And I suppose what we want to do now is just to look at some of the numbers, reflect back upon success in those areas or otherwise. Uh, the first one is church planting, evangelism and church planting. It makes up half of our complete total and it's been an incredibly difficult journey at times. Uh, going back to January 2020, we looked at the figures, we were 200,000 off track in this area. But as Ben was saying earlier, the beauty of strategy and of tracking this stuff is what you're able to do is to see, actually, where is God visibly at work? And we accept that the Holy Spirit is at work in places that we can't see. But our challenge was to get behind some of those fruitful movements. Uh, movements that uh, were planting new churches, reaching people for Christ in Asia, to bring that learning and that training uh, to other parts uh, of Asia as well, into places like Bangladesh and Thailand. And really, we've seen that number grow and grow and grow. Now, one of the great miracles of this past five years was when we began just to count the numbers uh, around church planting, and we had realized that we had exceeded that number. In fact, exceeded it by 3,732. It feels like a small amount, but I'm just reminded with that extra 3,732 that God can and does do more than we could ever ask or imagine. Uh, education. Uh, now, education was strongly on track throughout the strategy last year with the COVID pandemic because schools weren't meeting, because certain programs couldn't happen. Uh, we feared this may not make uh, the target, but great to see the innovation uh, that happened amongst some of our education partners. And praise God, we surpassed that target. Justice Ministries uh, was off target. Uh, now, this is due to a few reasons. Firstly, some programs that we had hoped would develop within our justice partner organisations overseas didn't develop as we had hoped. We also parted company with some partners along the last five years. Now, of course, that damaged our, our overall kind of strategy target, but it was the right thing to do in those situations. I'll take development and health together briefly, uh, partly because in both of those cases, it tends to be worked out in the most marginalized and uh, also most fragile contexts. Firstly, around development, this is largely livelihoods and water sanitation and hygiene. And then around health, uh, this is where we're providing uh, both uh, preventative healthcare as well as curative healthcare. With development, again, we exceeded that target and that was strong throughout. And in the case of healthcare, uh, we tripled the target. And really, uh, healthcare has been a provision, something that BMS has been providing admission for a very, very long time. It continues to be part of who we are. And it was great to see uh, how really bold and courageous mission workers in particular were able to give life-saving care in places like Bardai in the central Sahara, in central Afghanistan, in N'Djamena. These are not easy places to work. On leadership, uh, this does refer to creating missionary leaders, and it often does cover some of the seminary partners that we have in places like Beirut through ABTS, uh, in Amsterdam with IBTSC, uh, in Peru with Sebal, but it also covers the work that happens in the UK, uh, the work that's done through events like Catalyst Life, or training that happens at MTH in Birmingham. Again, it's a modest target, and as you see from the figures, we were pleased that we nearly tripled that target. Finally, uh, relief. Now, going into last year, we were significantly off track within relief ministry, about 60,000 people actually by January 2020. Obviously, last year was, uh, was a, a terrible year uh, in terms of the COVID pandemic. Uh, but through relief ministry, that was primarily where we were able to provide support to partners as they changed the programs they were doing to meet local needs. We would normally make about 20 relief grants in a year. Last year, we made 45. And as a consequence, 44,000 people were reached last year, pushing this over the target as well. 
So really across the board, uh, apart from within the justice ministry, uh, there was wide-ranging success. And this is really where I think we reflect upon last year as being significant. Of course, what could have happened during the pandemic, it could have been the case that churches thought, these are difficult economic times. Let's keep that money for ourselves, but you gave generously. It could have been the case that staff said, let's all go on furlough and we'll buckle down and we will not engage with the world. It could have been the case that partners simply said we will look after our own. But we rallied and we prayed and we saw the need. We encouraged partners to change what they were doing, enable them to do emergency responses. And this last year, which could have been the most difficult year, was actually the most fruitful year with over 400,000 people reached. And for that, we can only say that it's God at work and we give thanks. In addition, uh, we set some priorities for ourselves. We said that we would work amongst the most marginalised, the least evangelised and the most fragile. And so amongst the most marginalised, we said that we would work in the bottom quarter of the Human Development Index, spending a third of our resources amongst those most impoverished countries. That's a target which we exceeded. We also said we would work in the bottom third countries of the world where Jesus was least known. Uh, that's our least evangelized strategy and that we would spend half of our overseas resources in those places. Again, a target that we met. We also said we would work in 10 of the 20 most fragile states in any given year. Uh, fragility within the world uh, comes and goes, and so we had to take this as a year-by-year -year target. Uh, unfortunately, and this was a very difficult ask, we didn't meet that target. So we met least evangelised, we met most marginalised, and around about 85% met on most fragile. Now numbers, they can mean nothing but we were determined that numbers would not mean nothing but they would indeed have meaning uh, and so what we have to imagine here is almost a spectrum and on the one hand you can have a whole bunch of activities where there's passive engagement from people perhaps they've been recipients of training uh, perhaps they have merely kind of listened to a radio broadcast and as partners reported back we looked closely to identify where we had seen some contribution towards a change in someone's life. And so the spectrum goes all the way across to circumstances where we see really significant attributable, attributable change towards people's entire worldviews. And so what we sought to do was to record meaningful change. If we had recorded everything that partners had reported, then we could have counted, for example, literally millions of people reached by radio broadcast in Uganda through UCLF. But we pulled back and we said we want to see evidence of meaningful change. We also recognise that the Holy Spirit is changing people in ways that we cannot see. And so we also, whilst we can't count those numbers, we also recognise that that's a work of God that has been happening. Also, uh, numbers are only important if you learn lessons from them. If we look at the numbers, what they really are, uh, are, are a collage. It's like looking at a collage picture made up of many individual stories. So you can read trends and read key learning across this. And what did we see? Well, we saw that many of the partner organisations that we work with around the world are hugely capable. They have fruitful ministries. And so really how we support them to be resilient, how we support them to continue to do what they do brilliantly for generations to come is a critically important question for us. We've also seen that people are going from everywhere to everywhere, that there are fruitful evangelists that we work with right across the world. We would love to see more people go. We would love them to share the gospel with more people. We would love to see more lives transformed for him. Finally as well, what we've seen is that mission workers are awesome. We have seen them work in some of the most difficult places. We have seen the tears and the sacrifice that they've made. And we've seen God take that and God use that to transform lives. 
And so as we finish, what do we take away from the past five years of strategy? Well, I think what we take away is this, that we can set a strategy, but really all we're hoping to do is participate within what God is already doing. And we've seen him weave together the right people with the right skills in the right places at the right time with the right resources backed up by your prayers and your generosity and then miracles happen. And so ultimately, yes, 1.3 million lives transformed. But really, glory be to God. Ah, oh, that is absolutely phenomenal. In fact, before we go on, let's just take a moment to pray and to praise God. Father God, thank you for this challenge, for this chance to gather together and to celebrate what you have done in your world and the opportunity you've given us to be a part of it. And bless us as we reflect on that now and as we dream together with you of what that future can look like. Amen. I don't know about you, but... Uh, I love hearing those big numbers, 1.3 million lives saved, that is phenomenal. But I also want to hear the individual stories of those people whose lives have been changed because of you working together with Christian brothers and sisters around the world. And this is fantastic because we get the chance to, to talk about them now. And as I was thinking about maybe a couple of the stories to share this morning, I, I just couldn't resist uh, telling you about Susan. And Susan always sticks in my mind because she's got this grin from ear to ear and, to be honest, she reminds me of my cheeky great aunt. She's an elderly lady from South Sudan. She lives on her own. Um, but unlike my great aunt, uh, she is unfortunately unable to walk. And I suppose because I had this picture of, of my great aunt in my mind, when I heard her story, I, I just was, oh, I was just blown away, really. Um, when conflict broke out around Susan's home, she obviously and understandably tried to get away, she tried to flee, but she's unable to walk. And so the only way that she could do that was by crawling. And I'm sure that you are the same as me and, and you can think of a, a loved one or a family member and imagine them being in that situation and, and what that must have been like for her. Thankfully and praise to God, a good Samaritan was passing by and, and as Shane said last night, you know, allowed that godly interruption in their life and they actually helped Susan to get over the border to safety in Uganda. Now, unfortunately, they actually weren't able to help her go any further than that. So, so she was in a place of safety, but really, to be honest, she was, she was just in the middle of nowhere. Um, she wasn't able to get to a refugee camp um, and therefore she wasn't actually able to access some of the food that was on offer there. Well, God just had his hands all over Susan's life because thanks to supporters like yourself in the UK, standing with Christian brothers and sisters in that part of Uganda, they were able to spring into action and they were able to reach out to the refugees who were arriving in their country. They found Susan and not only were they able to help her access food, but they actually were able to visit her weekly and they opened the word of God to her and they prayed with her. And she later told us that 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 pastoral and that spiritual support was the thing that was giving her strength. Oh, have we got time for one more, Ben? Oh, let's squeeze, <laughs> let's squeeze one in. Um, the, the other story I was so keen to share with you was the story of Malik and Sarah. And I suppose that I was so keen to share it because I think it's one that we've probably got a better understanding of now in the UK. Malik and Sarah are a brother and sister from Syria and they were bombed out of their home and they had to flee and they arrived in Lebanon and missed out on two years of education. And I suppose we've really, really seen what that actually means now here uh, in our country. You know, we've seen that it's not just about children missing out on the education itself. It's about children who are already in really vulnerable positions becoming even more precariously situated. It's about the mental health problems that can result or the lack of development maybe missing out on exams, which are going to change somebody's entire future life trajectory. And so I suppose as you picture Malik and Sarah, you know, you can, you can be imagining some of those young people that you know who've been affected in that way, and imagine if that had been going on for two years, what that might have been like. Well, praise God, um, Christians here in the UK were standing with Christians in Lebanon who were running an education centre, which Malik and Sarah were able to access. 
They started catching up on their schooling and their learning, but also the Christian witness and the Christian love that they saw there actually resulted in their mum deciding to give her life to Christ and bring faith into that family. Lives transformed here on earth and lives transformed in heaven because of people standing together in the UK with those around the world. Praise God, give him the glory. Sarah, thank you for taking the time to, to share those with us. I've heard those stories before and they still make me tingle. I'm hearing them again uh, from you now. But where do we go next? One million lives transformed. Do we say, that's it, job done, we all go home? Um, well, I, I think you're here in this seminar because you, you believe the same as us. That we will stand with those in the ditch, as Shane said last night, uh, for as long as God calls us to to do so and so as this last season draws to a close and we think about uh, where God is leading us in the next steps uh, that's where we'll turn our attention to now and it won't surprise you to hear our mission hasn't changed we exist to bring people to a saving faith in our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and experience of the abundant life that only he can provide so we'll still be reaching out in word and deed to people like Susan who need spiritual and physical nourishment and to children who've missed school and their exhausted parents who need to hear of the hope of eternal life in Christ. We'll still be helping people get the medical attention they need. And we'll still be there to help people uh, when disaster, or flood, famine or pandemic strike. I think with what we've learned over the last five years, we believe in faith that we can have an even greater impact in the next five years to come. And Kang San is going to tell us a little bit more about that now. Thank you, Ben. As we look at the next five years, we look at a context where two-thirds of the world don't yet follow Christ, where 8,000 people groups have never heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I grew up in a Buddhist home at the age of 17 years old where a Christian friend gave me the Bible for the first time. And today there are still millions of Buddhists, Hindus and communities that have yet to hear the gospel. We minister in a context where two-thirds of those who are Christians are amongst the world's poorest and most marginalized. We see a world where huge numbers of people are on the move. If refugees and displaced peoples were a country, its population, could you believe it, would be more than the UK and Ireland combined. As we look at that picture of the world around us, what we sense that God is calling BMS, God is calling you as Baptist community to consider is not only the changes that we long to see on the ground, but also how we go about achieving them as a whole Baptist Church. And that's why over the next five years, we are seeking to serve three particular groups of people. The most marginalized, the least evangelized, and the people on the move. The first two of these will be very familiar to many of you. We believe God is calling us to continue serving those in the least evangelized countries. We will proudly continue our work in some of the most close countries in the world, being a source of spiritual and practical light and hope in countries with less than 5% declared Christians. These are the least evangelized countries. It's often not safe for us to talk about the details of this work 
But in these places, we continue to send workers. We continue to provide practical help, like access to food and water in the name of Jesus and witness in our lives and help grow God's church as we do so. Secondly, we believe God is also calling us to continue serving people in the most marginalized countries. Those facing poverty of opportunity, money, stability, and hope. We'll continue our work to provide education, ministry in rainforests, health care in deserts, outreach and prayers campaign. Although the need in each place might look different, in each we seek to bring abundance of life where hunger and hopelessness bite. We've been working really hard to support people staying in home nations where they face few opportunities to hear about Jesus and live lives far from the fullness that Jesus promises. But we recognize that in our, our ever more connected world, people sometimes choose us or choose to live in search for a safe place to live and raise their families. Or they are forced to live, threatened by persecution, war, flooding, or the lack of life's basics like food and clean water. Our world have regularly informed us of these tremendous masses of refugees today. People like Susan, Malik, or Sarah, who are now on the move. So thirdly, we are seeking to serve those who are among the least evangelized and most marginalized in the world. Then, if we are truly seeking these people, then we can't forget those who are on the move in this way. As well as seeking to bring abundance to their home nations, we'll meet them on the move, on the way, in their journeys. Whether in the camps of Greece, or in host countries like Lebanon, and indeed in Europe, and the UK, so that we can stand together to show and tell them about the wonderful love of Christ. And that's what we are going to do. But it's also going to be an expansion, not only what we'll do, but how are we going to do it. A hundred years ago, BMS was sending 500 British missionaries to work overseas. Praise God for our history. As many of you know that this is still an important part of what we do today. We equip those from the UK who are called to mission. We support them through your help, through your partnership, through your prayers, and this continue to be an important part of what BMS is committed to do. To serve around the world. Many of you here are already standing with these mission workers. And of course, we are still going to do that. But think about this. William Carey, our founder, once wrote that he hoped the necessity of sending Europeans out to preach the gospel would be superseded. Hundreds of years ago, Carey has this vision, this foresight, this prophetic desire that the necessity of sending Europeans would be superseded. And that's by raising up leaders in the local churches. And what we saw in the last five years was that this vision started to become a reality. 
of those 1 million lives, in fact 1.3 million lives that have been transformed in the last five years, many were reached by local mission workers, sent by partners supported by BMS. And you know of some of these names. In many parts of the world where mission workers previously went, local Christian communities are stepping forward in strength, in vitality, in desire to expand the sending of their own evangelists, cross-cultural disciple makers within their Judea, their Samaria, and indeed beyond their nations. We, BMS, want to share with you this exciting vision to take another incremental, intentional step forward in this new direction. Specifically about partnering with churches and Baptist networks to pool our resources, our knowledge, our experiences together. So we can together send all of those who God has called to mission. Not only British, but Global Baptist, the Harvest Force together. And for that, I am really excited to introduce to you my dear friend, the Reverend R.D. Variadinata. R.D. is a director of mission for the Asia Pacific Baptist Federation, who is now a co-mission partner, supported partner worker with BMS. And R.D. is going to tell us a bit more about how we'll be working together to reach out with the love of Christ in new ways across his region. Greetings from the Asia Pacific Baptist Federation. We value the partnership that we have together working alongside BMS to be part to partake in God's mission, especially here in the Asia and Pacific region. We appreciate the polycentric model of the BMS, allowing us to connect in the local level. And you know, we pray and we look forward to be able to develop this kind of model all throughout the Asian Pacific region, especially for the DMM. We really appreciate the discipleship making movement that the BMS is strongly advocating and emphasizing because we believe that discipleship that's the way and the means that God has designed for us uh, to live and we see it all throughout the scripture and we look forward how we can help and equip the local churches all of the Baptist churches in the Asian Pacific region to be able to equip to partake in the discipleship making process in the local churches especially how more mature Christian can disciple the younger Christian because we believe the young Christian will be the future of the church, will be the future of society. And we believe that uh, the disciples will infiltrate all aspects of society, thus transforming and influencing the whole of society and influencing all of Asia and Pacific for God's glory. So we really value our partnership and look forward to strengthen and develop our collaboration that we may offer uh, fruits, sacrifice, all for the glory of God. God bless. Thank you, Kang San, and, and thank you, Ardi, as well, for sharing. Just a moment to say, we're, we're aware of the building noise going on in the background. A couple of you have mentioned it in the chat. We do apologize. Um, we, we'll try and get that sorted as the day goes on. If there's anything you miss at any point as, as a result of that, we'll have the Q&A at the end. Just um, pop the question in the chat, and we'll be sure to clarify it as well. I also want to read out a lovely quote from Graham on the chat, who says this, The sound of construction noises in the background was a helpful reminder to me that God and his people are always at work and often in the background. So thank you um, for that positive spin on the circumstances, Graham. 
There's a couple more things about the way in which we're going to work into the future, which, which are important to us now and will be, will be even more so um, as, uh, as the new strategy period comes into effect. And we're going to be hearing from a couple of people around the world about that. And we're going to start by hearing from our colleague Laura in Peru about our commitment to creation care. For me, a world where BMS World Mission isn't supporting a good creation stewardship is one where we're not taking the whole Bible or the whole purpose of God seriously. Uh, our holy book begins with our creator, the God we love, um, creating out of primordial disorder uh, a world which is productive and resource free, fit for his beloved children, uh, us, uh, to live and thrive in and then he basically says see what I've done go and go forth and do likewise um, so whatever else that we do whilst we're here on this planet that will always be uh, the original framework for our God ordained existence which is why this is an important part of BMS's strategy uh, here in the Peruvian Amazon where I have the great privilege of serving with BMS World Mission no one needs convincing that creation is the basis of everyday life because it's self-evident uh, and the consequences of bad stewardship uh, are also very often self-evident and direct. Uh, in the UK perhaps we're relatively sheltered from the impacts of our bad, bad stewardship so it's still possible to think that creation stewardship is something that we can choose to opt into or opt out of. Uh, it's not. <laughs> God has given us one world, uh, we're all connected, we're all neighbors uh, whether it's convenient for us now in this moment uh, or not so I'm excited about this area of work because um, firstly God's creation is phenomenal literally um, because Christians you know we have more reason than anyone else to value uh, the handiwork of our God uh, here in the jungle people think that working the land being a farmer is only for the uneducated uh, and I love reading Genesis with my brothers and sisters here when they see how working the land was actually one of the most important responsibilities that our Creator ever gave us. That delights and, and humbles me every time. Now just as creation care affects us all, sadly the issue of gender injustice affects us all. And the challenging situations faced by many people around the world are often only compounded if they are women. And Louise Lynch is going to be speaking to us from Bangladesh about this a little bit more. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus says, Much is required from the person to whom much is given. Much more is required to whom much more is given. I have been reflecting on that verse over this past week in relation to my work here in Bangladesh, but it also struck a chord when I was thinking about gender and justice. So for me, a world where BMS World Mission isn't concentrating on gender injustice is a world where those of us who have been given much in terms of a voice, opportunity and influence fail to use that voice on behalf of those who have no voice or no opportunity or no influence. This is such an important part of BMS's strategy as across the world and in countries where BMS works and has influence, people's life chances are being influenced by their gender their right to be born, their right to have the right food, their right to have treatment, their right to reach adulthood without being mutilated, their right to property. And societies are missing out because women aren't taking a full part in life, bringing their skills, their voice, their perspective to the work that needs to be done. I'm so excited about this area of work because I believe as Christians that we have good news for women. We are created in the image of God, esteemed, loved, forgiven, adopted by God. And as part of the church family, we're in a place where there is no room for discrimination on the basis of gender. Truly, this is good news. This is part of the gospel that we bring. So here we have new strategy. Uh, the prospect of continuing that ministry amongst the most marginalized, amongst the least evangelized parts of the world, working with people that are on the move, but with that emphasis upon uh, gender, that emphasis also upon creation stewardship. It's a strategy that was not arrived at easily. We had to listen and we had to learn, but I have confidence, as I think we all do uh, within the team, 
that we did listen. We listened to the World Church. We listened to our churches in the UK as well. We, we matched what we were learning against Scripture. Uh, we prayed earnestly. We sought God's leading. And so this is what we believe God has led us to for the next period of BMS's life and ministry. So we pray that you'll join us within this next part of the BMS family's journey into the purposes of God in the world. We'd, uh, we're going to pray uh, in a second. I'll invite my, uh, my friend and colleague Kwame Adzam, who's the, uh, the overseas team leader for evangelism, uh, to pray for us in a second. Uh, there are, of course, mission workers who have been going overseas. Here are just a few that we can talk about. There's others that we can't, uh, who have gone overseas in the last 18 months. Uh, Gareth and Beth and Shrubsoul joining us again, and this time working at Guinea Bore 2 Hospital in Chad. Also at Guinea Bore 2, Tom and Mel Spears, uh, working uh, at, on curative health and on public health awareness. Uh, and also Brian and Jackie Chilvers, also in Chad at Guinea Bore 2. Uh, both uh, nurses. And we'd love you to pray for both the vision with us. We'd love you to pray as well for some of these guys who are making sacrifices and doing extraordinary things in extraordinary places. Kwame. Hello, my name is Kwame Adza. I'm the overseas team leader for evangelism and discipleship at BMS. I would like you to join me as we pray for BMS and sing the Lord's blessing over this Baptist assembly. Our prayers are going to be in three parts. Firstly, we're going to give thanks to God. Secondly, we're going to supplicate and intercede for BMS. And thirdly, we're going to speak the Lord's blessing over the assembly. Psalm 136 verse 1 reminds us, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercies endures forever. Let us give thanks to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you in the name that is above every other name, the name Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the gift of eternal life that you have freely given unto us on account of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is in this grace we stand, enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit to bless your holy name for the things that you have done through BMS in the past. We also particularly celebrate your great work in the past five years of over one million lives transformed through the demonstration of the gospel in word and in deed and the outpouring of your extravagant love in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Father, we declare, for disciples made and churches planted, we say thank you. For BMS partners and personnel, we say thank you. For BMS staff, for BMS supporters around the world, we say thank you. For Baptist family in the UK and the Baptist family globally, we say thank you. For ministers and members of churches who have stood with us, we say thank you. For those who have given, for those who have gone onto the mission field, for those who on their knees cry out for your grace, we say thank you. For each individual, for families, for communities that have recognized your purpose and trusted to BMS and join with us by the power of your Holy Spirit. For all that has been done, we say thank you. We testify not unto us, not unto us, but to your holy name, we give the glory. For it is your hand of victory that has prevailed over us. It is your resources, the supply of your spirit, of your wisdom, that all that has been accomplished has been possible. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Secondly, we're going to pray uh, for BMS work in the future. We'll be working in three programmatic areas in the list evangelized, most marginalized, and people on the move context. We're going to ask God for three things, for wisdom, for humility, and for a heart of learning to collaborate with God's people around the world. Let's pray. 
And so, Father, we ask once again, recognizing our limitations and our inability to fully accomplish the great commission entrusted to us. And so we come and we cry out, Lord, grant us the spirit of wisdom that we may learn to use the resources given to us, offering our utmost for your highest glory. We pray that give us hearts of humility as we testify that we don't know it all. There are others who know things and have things that we need to join with. We also recognize that which you have entrusted to us and we pray for humble hearts that we may be willing to learn and to listen, to collaborate with others, to fulfill your mission. It is this one thing we seek, that Christ will be lifted up and that the nations will be drawn to him, that disciples will be made and churches will be planted, that people will fall in love with Jesus and find and receive from him the gift of eternal life that he alone freely offers. And for this, Lord, we ask, pour out your spirit upon us. Grant us grace and grant us your strength. We don't have what it takes. We look to you alone. Help us, Lord, that what you have given to us in our generation will be fulfilled. And when our task is done, we may faithfully pass on the button to the next generation who will go forth in the power of the Spirit of God, in the humility of Christ, and in the wisdom of the Spirit of the living God. So for this, Lord, hear our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen. And finally, we're going to speak the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord causes his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the name of the Lord be a shield over you. May his presence go before you. May God bless the work of your hands. May his spirit outpour over you. Let the Lord anoint you with fresh oil. And for this season and for this reason, Remember, you are blessed and highly favored to be a blessing to the nations. Go in the strength of the resurrected one who lives forevermore and makes intercession for us. Jesus Christ, our good shepherd, the chief missionary, the Lord and savior of the whole world. You are blessed to be a blessing in Jesus name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you Kwame for leading us and thank you at home for praying with us, not just this morning but just consistently throughout the, the past five years and we value and so desire your prayers for the next few. So now we're turning over to you. We would love you to put your questions and your comments in the chat and we'll have a go at answering them for you. Okay, so a few have been coming through already, so thank you for putting those through. We'll start with a question that's come through from Linda earlier in the session, which says, can we share the video, the You Did It video in our churches? Um, Sarah, how can, how can they share that video? Oh, we would love you to share that video. Yes, please. We'll pop a link in the chat for you and you can follow that. And we'd encourage you all to, to really celebrate with your churches what we have achieved together over the last few years. Brilliant. Uh, a few comments as well. So thank you for the comments coming through. I'll read out a few of them now as the questions arrive. Uh, firstly from Gerald saying thanks for the, for the encouraging views about creation care. Um, uh, a thank you from the, the Centre for Baptist Studies in Oxford who say thank you BMS team an inspiring vision for the next five years. Uh, a comment here from uh, Elizabeth Lee, well done everyone, some excellent and inspiring information, which is fantastic news. Uh, uh, another question now that's just come through, what are you most proud of from the last five years? And let me pass that question over to Kang San. What are you most proud of from the last five years? I think we are just grateful for just a tremendous commitment from the British family. We continue to give sacrificially during the times of pandemic, uh, although we projected some 
difficult times, and yet in, in the last few years, uh, re recently, we continue to see that giving continue. But within the last five years, you have seen just the holistic aspects of ministries. And we have seen British uh, workers working in partnership, particularly also supporting some of our partners together. And uh, I, I think from here, we will see that the least evangelized, the most marginalized, and the people on the move will, con will become a, a greater source of partnership, both with the World Church, but also there will always be a role for our British uh, churches together in prayer, in support, as well as sending the best of our young men and women. Brilliant. Thanks, Kang San, and thanks for that question. Uh, another couple of comments now. All very encouraging for us wherever uh, we are. God has a plan for all of us. Thank you for that comment from J.M. Knocker. Uh, we've also got a comment from Emma Waters who says, I don't know about all those listening, but feeling very uplifted. Well, we're pleased you're feeling uplifted. We are too, and even more so for your comment. So thank you, Emma. Um, a question now, again, uh, for the uh, Centre for Baptist Studies in Oxford, who asked this, how has the re regime change in Myanmar affected your work there? Um, Steve, can I pass this one over to you? Uh, yes, we can easily answer that question so far as our work in Myanmar has primarily been around relief work through the Asia Pacific Baptist uh, Aid, and, and that continues. Uh, it is a challenge uh, to get money into that country, of course, to support. Uh, the church that's suffering, very large Baptist convention in Myanmar as well, of course. Uh, we have also advocated and we have also uh, asked that the UK would uh, support moves to hasten elections within that country, recognising that uh, we do believe the military regime that's there is only meant to be an interim arrangement. Uh, so do continue to pray for Baptists in that country and indeed pray for peaceful transition back to democracy in Burma as well. Thanks, Steve. Uh, the next question, what one thing can churches do to demonstrate care for creation? That's coming from Russell, and I'll pass that over to Sarah. Oh, great. What a great question. I'm going to cheat and I'm going to have two. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, uh, a question here about what we do as a whole church. And I know it's boring, guys, but our pensions. Let's think about divestment from fossil fuels and shift that over to green energy. But then there's also what we can do as individuals and as congregations. And I think Christians have done a good job here, but there's still more to go in, in sacrificially looking at our own lives and saying what might be some of the shifts that we can make um, as individuals and as a community around our own carbon footprint, around any offsetting perhaps, around some of those choices that we might make in our shopping and in our travel. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, the next question, Kang San, this one's coming to you. And this is, uh, what is the most inspiring evangelism work at the moment that we can learn from? Well, many of you have heard about the discipleship making movement. These are grassroots uh, evangelistic movements where we find that there's a multiplication of communities. When people hear the gospel, they just share it with their neighbors and they keep sharing. So I think this is a, a tremendous opportunity where Christianity, the new movements of followers after Jesus, who do not identify themselves with a Western idea of churches. They are local, grassroots, uh, multi-application uh, group. So it, it is a, a real encouragement for us to learn from this movement, not only in India, uh, in Bangladesh, and in many other countries as well. Brilliant. A real encouragement indeed. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions heading your way, Steve. I'll throw two at you at once. The first is, what partners do we currently have in Israel and Palestine? And then the second question is, how has the pandemic affected your work, and do you see things changing with the vaccine implementation? Uh, that second question coming in from Andrew, the first one from PRBC. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, first around Israel-Palestine, we uh, do work with groups like uh, the Bethlehem Bible College, also with the, uh, the Israeli Baptists. Uh, and so uh, that, that's work that continues as we kind of seek to support the leadership uh, and some of the teaching that happens in those two contexts. Uh, in terms of the second question around 
how the pandemic has affected our work and what goes forward with that. Well, the pandemic has affected every area of work. Uh, and in this last year, uh, I think I alluded to some of this, the extent to which there were programs that just simply had to change because people couldn't meet in buildings, they couldn't go to the community and do what they had to do. Uh, we've been talking throughout the year with partners about how they can meet some of those emergency needs and what they can do and make their activities safe. Uh, you know, going forward, the world will look very different. And uh, much as there's obviously a necessity around the vaccine being rolled out, and we've been calling for, uh, for universal vaccination, we've been calling for uh, participation within the COVAX instrument. I suppose what we do see still is that whilst there is COVID uh, anywhere, we run the risk of COVID being everywhere. That's particularly true in India and Nepal just now. And again, just praying with and supporting partners in those contexts. Of course, this is about advocacy and it's about lobbying. And we, do, we would encourage you to continue to pray and to also insist from those in power that they contribute generously to the COVAX instrument. I think that's the most I can say about that. Great, thank you, Steve. Uh, next question coming in from Tony, and we've got time for just a couple more, I think, as, uh, as one o'clock nears. Uh, but the next question coming in from Tony Maud says this, I understand that mission workers based in Chad have been repatriated recently. Do you have an update on the situation there? Sarah, why don't you give us an update? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, this was a difficult situation all round, and um, I think we'd currently characterise the situation on the ground as tense but calm <laughs> and as a result we've been able to reassess some of the risk there and we are hoping to have our workers back in Chad in the quite near future so do keep an eye out and we'll keep you posted of course as that takes place. Great. Uh, a question now coming in from Danielle and this may have to be our last one looking at the time I'll pass it to you Kang San and the question is this are you able to say what sort of areas of work BMS is involved in, in the least evangelised and most dangerous countries. And following on from that, how can we best pray for those serving in such difficult contexts? Yeah, certainly. I, I think there are quite, quite a number of areas. Uh, we continue to work in, in, in North Africa, and the church are quite small. Uh, we also work in partnership with our British, our Baptist churches in Bangladesh to think about reaching out with their Muslim neighbours. In many of these areas, including in North India, where while the church in India are quite, uh, quite mature and growing, but in North India, it continued to be least evangelised. We hear of these discipleship-making movements where often new converts' uh, lives can be uh, quite, quite in danger. So, Although it is dangerous, we find that God is faithful. And that is the exciting thing about mission today. I do hope to plug and, and say, please link up with BMS. You can get more stories. A lot of these workers in the least evangelized will need your prayers. Maybe you can adopt them uh, as they face some of these challenges. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid, from all of us here. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you enjoy the rest of the assembly. We'll look forward to seeing you at other seminars or tomorrow morning when we all join in worship together. Thank you and God bless you.